The Culture Alliance in the heart of Georgian Bay represents the Bosley First Nation, the towns of Midland and Penetanguishene, and the townships of Tay and Tiny. We recognize that the region represented by the Culture Alliance is located on land, which is the traditional and treaty territory of the Chippewas of Lakes Huron and Simcoe, now known as Chippewa Tri-Council, which comprises Beausoleil First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Islands First Nation. This territory is within the pre-Confederation Treaty 5, Treaty 16, and Treaty 18, and is included within the Williams Treaty of 1923. We also recognize that the region is located on land, which was once the territory of the Huron-Wendat, and that our communities are home to many citizens of the Métis Nation of Ontario and to a large and diverse community of Indigenous peoples. We're grateful to the sponsors for this evening's conference. The sponsors this evening are Bales Deschamps Wealth Management and Huronia Players Community Theatre. We express our thanks to them for making this program possible, and we hope you'll have the opportunity to thank them as well. We also express our gratitude to Simcoe County Tourism for their sponsorship of this conference and to Rogers TV for their technical support. As you know, the theme of this conference is obstacles and opportunities, finding the path to success. The theme of this evening's program is traditions, obstacles or opportunities, transitioning to paths to success. You know, many individuals and organizations and institutions face challenges in dealing with traditions, whether those traditions are religious or cultural or ethnic or familial or corporate or personal. Can the old ways find their way to the new economy? Can traditions provide guideposts for the path to success? Are traditions stumbling blocks? How can change be introduced to transition to paths for success without affronting or abandoning traditions, some of which are sacred? Well, for the first hour of this evening's program, we'll be featuring three special panelists. I'll introduce them in more detail later, but for now, let me welcome, and I'll have the panelists uh, wave if, if I may, uh, Joelle Roy is the director of La Fontaine's Festival de Lou, which she helped foster and grow into a regional and provincial success. Wanda Nanabush is the inaugural curator of Indigenous art and co-leader of the uh, co-lead of the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And Father Michael Knox is a Jesuit priest. He is the director of Martyr Shrine and superior of a newly established community of Jesuits in Chironia. So let's get started. And what I'm going to suggest is that we will begin by hearing from Joelle. Uh, Joelle Roy received her PhD in Francophone Studies in 2009 from the University of Louisiana. Her thesis was published as a novel portraying French culture in Huronia, right here, and was nominated for a Trillium Award. As director of La Fontaine's Festival de Lou for the past nine years, Joelle's unique brand of creativity and resilience has helped foster and grow this festival into the regional and provincial success it's become. Joelle, let's begin by hearing from you. Thank you, Fred. Well, good evening, everyone. It's, um, it's an honor to be here tonight to discuss this fascinating topic. Are traditions obstacles or opportunities in gathering a community for the purpose of celebrating or sharing an artistic moment? Well, tradition is a double-edged sword. Let's start with the easy side. Is tradition a path to success? Yes, it's an easy path to success, I, I, I would say. Humans are creatures of habit. We love to go back to what we know. It's comforting, it's reassuring, it's natural. Successful organizations use traditions all the time to create this sense of belonging among the public. 
The key is to excavate the story behind that tradition. Everyone likes a good story. Where does this tradition come from? Who, what, when, where? In recent years, we have witnessed an instant success in our area that shows how an activity presented and marketed as our tradition can draw a huge crowd. Can you guess? The Midland Butter Tart Festival. <laughs> Personally, I knew absolutely nothing about butter tart history. Then you hear about the very first butter tart ever made around Aurelia. And then you hear maybe it was closer to Barry, or was it this guy's great-great-grandmother in Tay Township? You know, it's getting close to home. And controversy about the story gives it even more life. It matters. Quebec did the very same thing with Poutine. Now, traditions, old and new, culinary or behavioral, they bring people together. They nourish a basic need to belong to a group, to a community, the tribe as it's called in textbooks. Traditions are a guaranteed path to success if linked to a good story, a common pride, whether actual or fabricated. It is an excuse to reunite, which is what we crave. We feel proud, we feel alive when we are part of a group, a cause, a belief. Now that is so easy, isn't it? So let's look at the other edge of the sword. Can traditions be an obstacle? Yes, also, absolutely. Because you can become imprisoned by the image that is linked to the tradition you are marketing. As an example, I'll use our Festival du Loup, French-Canadian festival in La Fontaine. It's a heritage festival that is based on a great story, the legend of the wolf of La Fontaine. Due to the threat the wolf presented, people banded together to help one another against a common enemy. Now, the image projected of our culture is of lumberjacks, fiddlers, square dancing, the, uh, the French joie de vivre. We still have an elder generation that identifies with those traditions. Some still have memories, uh, images as associated with, with those images. But will they hold meaning for future generations, 10, 15, 20 years down the line? Not necessarily. And that is the catch-22 with, with tradition. Even though they rely on old raw material, on old ways, for people to rely on them, they need to have been rejuvenated by an approach that is more current, that is modern. A tradition will last forever if its DNA is universal. You need to find its essence, the core that is still true today. The essence of the Festival du Loup is not about killing a wolf. It's about people uniting to, first, to face adversity. And that still holds meaning in our community today. In fact, the festival has played an important role in fostering pride around this celebrated definition of the French community. I'll conclude with a nod to the elephant in the room, COVID-19. As inconvenient as it is, it has provoked an unprecedented opportunity to implement new traditions. It also allows us time to reflect and assess the so-called traditions that we have entertained before the pandemic. It has handed us a clean slate. Let's make the best of it. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. I think you've gotten us off to a good start, and uh, I think there's something there that we'll uh, we'll pursue further as the uh, as the evening wears on. 
Well, our second speaker this evening is Wanda Nanabush. And Wanda, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is uh, uh, associated with the Art Gallery of Ontario. Wanda is an Anishinaabe artist, writer, curator, and community organizer from Bosley First Nation. And that is one of the five member communities that are part of the Cultural Alliance in the Heart of Georgian Bay, which is sponsoring this event. Wanda is a, a, the inaugural curator of Indigenous art and the co-leader of the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department at the Art Gallery of Ontario. On top of her many catalog essays, Wanda has published widely on Indigenous art, politics, history, and feminism, and sexuality. Wanda will be delighted to hear from you. Thank you so much, Fred. And i um, really happy to be here speaking with Michael and Joelle as well. And Hello, hello out there to you invisible internet universe. <laughs> nice to see you all as well. And hopefully we can have a discussion in a little bit. So Wanda Nanabush, Nadizhna Kaz, Anishinaabe Kwe, uh, Bosle, uh, Donjiba, uh, Mayangan, Dodem. So that was an example of a tradition, <laughs> but a custom. <laughs> custom because it's, it's slowly becoming a tradition again. Um, the way we introduce ourselves is to locate our name, our place, our community. Often we would also say our family names. Um, both of my parents come from Christian Island or Georgian Bay, um, both Slay First Nation, also Chimnissing. Um, and I also told you that I'm Wolf Clan, so hopefully you don't kill and eat wolves because they're my kin. <laughs> So I think that's kind of interesting. <laughs> we'll have to recuperate the wolves at the end of the, um, anyway. Um, but that gives me like clan responsibilities and also a way to travel between communities um, to know I have family everywhere I go. And I was thinking a lot about this question and um, I could, I didn't know where to start because um, it's quite difficult, the question of tradition in um, the Anishinaabe context. So I thought I'd start at the, at the moment of breaking of tradition. And I wanted to talk about um, the, the kind of state of colonization and the way in which from 1880 until 1951, it's a very long time, almost 100 years, or 50, 60, 70, 80 years, <laughs> of um, legal banning of indigenous traditions, um, ceremonies, dances, songs, um, all different kinds of ways um, that traditions are passed on. Um, and the community also, the way that the community would govern itself and lead itself, um, the way that it would teach its young are through these kinds of things. And so all of those were, were um, banned by the newly inaugurated um, Canadian government through the British North American Act. It was still a colony, it wasn't yet, the constitution wasn't yet patriated, but it still was the one to enact these laws. And um, largely it changed in 1951 through a lot, of, a lot of work by indigenous people and our allies to get those laws changed. Um, it attacked particularly the Sundance and the Potlatch, um, two ceremonies where one, is a giveaway, but it's really a governance system, but it was seen as a giveaway, which goes contrary to kind of capitalist understandings of, of how one conducts life. Um, and the other um, similarly was uh, people were very afraid of it. Um, and then you get the period, this period is also the time of residential schools. So you can imagine, you know, entire communities where um, kids are being snapped up and put into um, residential schools. And I always think of it as going from color and love to going to gray and, and isolation, like physically and visually. And so it started making me think about um, when you break that relationship of passing on traditions, which is basically what was happening, um, it was a way to break the power of the community and the ability of the community to protect itself and to protect its lands. So then I was thinking about the kids, you know, um, 
how did we pass on traditions? What were those, those um, pathways to building a strong culture in a community? And the kids are considered to be the center of Anishinaabe life. Um, they're also considered to be closest to the spirit world when they come into the world. So elders and, and children are in a similar space, <laughs> um, both closest to the spirit world. Um, so they're actually our teachers rather than us just teaching them. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about um, two of the main ways that we teach is through storytelling um, and dreaming. It's the way we learn, it's the way we teach. Storytelling, dreaming. We also have ceremonies, um, songs, dances, stuff like that. So there are things you have to like memorize, say stories and things like that. But always, always knowledge, tradition, uh, ways of doing things is passed down through you. So it's always got to be personal. So at some level, um, tradition is always changing. So it's never really static. It's always something that's living. It's a living, breathing spirit thing. Um, and each storyteller, when they tell a story, um, they always give it their own inflection. Often the context will have changed. So so they'll tell you, um, you know, a brand new way and you'll have, you'll learn something completely different from that story each time. And my, because this is quick, I'm only just giving you really basic little points. These, these ideas are much deeper than that. And these traditions go on much, much longer and are connected to a lot of other ideas. Um, but storytelling in particular as a way of passing on tradition means that I think that for me, it means that the, the notion of rules or things that are unbreakable or um, the idea of traditions being unchanging um, doesn't make sense in the Anishinaabe context because stories are something that are, are fluid. There's something performed, therefore always personally inflected. They're also, um, they change over time, they change with context. And so knowledge itself becomes something much more fluid as well. And so often with a story, you'll understand one thing I'm saying right now, right now you'll get something from it, but you know, 15 years from now, something else I said will pop up and you'll learn something else from that, from that original story that you might've heard. Um, and I think that's, that also says a lot about how traditions are passed on in the Anishinaabe context. I work in a museum, so I I work constantly in the context of somebody else's traditions, and constantly in the context of traditions that have been damaging to my people, or have suppressed my people. So I think that it's um, interesting to try and carve out a space in that for indigenous traditions, whether they be Anishinaabe, whether they be Haudenosaunee, whoever's, um, or Blackfoot, whichever traditions we're kind of dealing with at whatever point in time. So one of the ways in which I decided to work was to walk in fully as an Anishinaabe kwe and woman and try to figure out how can I operate in this space as myself without, without having to change everything all at once. Um, and one of the things we did was to start the department um, from the notion of nation to nation agreements, which were the wampum treaties, the original kind of treaties of this land. So I'm thinking about 1764, I'm thinking about the two row wampum, I'm thinking about a number of wampum treaties. And the, the value system that's embedded in that is very different than Western wet, written treaties. And some of those are like the values of sharing, the values of um, mutual responsibility, mutual sharing, um, values of respect, integrity, honesty. Um, these kinds of things um, generally are not actually what you have to think about when you work in a cultural space. <laughs> you know, we're, we're usually thinking about what we're gonna get done, but not how we're gonna get it done and what is the value system we're, in, we're putting into place. And often in Western institutions, those values are actually contradicted. Um, so yeah, so this is some of the ways in which I think traditions, Anishinaabe thinking, Anishinaabe ways of being are informing uh, the way I work in a museum, the way, we op the way we build the museum, the way we show art, the way we talk about art, 
all the kind of philosophies we can bring into play, um, make it um, more of an Anishinaabe space. So I'm almost laying a land claim inside inside the building. But yeah, so I was I wanted to say a few of those things just to set a different ground because it's not such an easy question to walk into. And I think the last thing I will say is that the arts has been central to the way in which indigenous folk have reclaimed their traditions or have been able to rebuild them or have been able to transform them for now. Very good, thank you, that's great. Uh, I suspect we're gonna have a lot of questions coming out of, uh, out of those comments, Wanda, and that's wonderful. Uh, our next uh, panelist this evening is Father Michael Knox. Father Michael is a Jesuit priest. He's involved in a number of ministries that include pastoral care to youth, uh, seminary formation, television, lecturing in history and Jesuit spirituality, writing, and sacramental ministry. He's been the director for a Martyr Shrine since 2016 and supervisor of a newly established community of Jesuits in Huronia since 2017. Father Michael, we look forward to your introductory comments. Thank you, Fred, very much. And I thank my fellow panelists for doing most of my work for me with excellent presentations. Um, and I welcome everyone who is uh, watching or listening from the, the safety of their homes. And please be assured of the prayers and thoughts of all of us here at Martyr Shrine for your safety and well-being. So the question of tradition, well, here you have uh, a priest sitting here and being asked about tradition. So uh, one could talk about a lot of different things, uh, but I'm also aware of the theme of the conference and also uh, some of the struggles and aspirations of individual artists who are watching this evening, um, as well as institutions of heritage, culture, and history. So I thought, for me, uh, the safest place to go is to begin with the definition of tradition, um, perhaps more of an academic uh, definition or um, the definitions that we hold in the dictionary. So uh, like uh, many cases, I turn to my right in my office and I pull out my Oxford Dictionary of Language, and I took a look at that just to see uh, what it had to say. And it defines tradition as an opinion or belief or custom that is handed down. Then it goes on to talk about some of the people, very important people watching this evening, I think, artistic or literary principles based on accumulated experience or continued usage. And then maybe of interest to some who are watching this evening, uh, doctrine supposed to have or supposed to have divine authority. So we have these different views of tradition that span the legal, sociocultural, that look into the fine arts and the artistic life, and also uh, faith systems uh, among the variety of faith systems that are actively uh, lived by Canadians and around the world. So the first thing I would say about tradition, and I myself am going to speak, I think, from as an historian, but as also uh, bring in a little bit of theology, because I guess that's partly why I'm here uh, for that perspective. Um, one of the things that when I speak to my students or when I'm uh, in public sphere talking about tradition that I like to highlight right away is sort of... Um, a cultural decision from the early modern period on into the Industrial Revolution uh, that actually affects us in a lot of ways today when we think about tradition. Namely, tradition is seen as something that could be considered restrictive. So we have a whole series of traditions, and these traditions are to be followed exactly, and they place us in a kind of box and in speaking with a lot of young people today, that's uh, one of the concerns that come up for many of them, that uh, from a faith tradition point of view, or the traditional notion of the family, or the traditional notion of how a wedding should be, or the traditional notion that your child is baptized, or the traditional notion of um, how a man or a woman should behave in society, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can often be considered to be boundaries that are meant to be crossed. And it's interesting that in the, the Christian perspective, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, quite a famous author, puts it in a different perspective and suggests that actually tradition is a freeing, is meant to be a freeing experience, which I find fascinating because it 
it goes in the face of, of the present view. And how is that true? Well, uh, I guess the easiest way to talk about it would be to say that if you're in the car on a road trip and you're the driver, as far as I know, the unsaid rule is that the driver gets to select the music on the journey since they're doing the work. Well, if you're driving along on this trip and there are other people in the car and you're in charge of the music, one of the things that you can do, and I've seen it many times, uh, is that you can be searching throughout the journey for the perfect song, the song that you want, the kind of music that you want to listen to. And luckily, we have hundreds of radio stations, especially with technology today, that are available to us. And as you go along and you're listening for that perfect song, one of the challenges that you would face right away is that while always searching for that perfect song, you never really land onto one station and you never really get to enjoy the music at all. And so from one perspective, one could say that tradition sets frameworks that create a freedom for us to truly enter into an experience, to truly enjoy something, to perhaps grow to understand something. They're not impenetrable barriers, uh, but they're meant to be uh, a way to wrap around us uh, and set perspective for us. So that's something I wanted to say right away, because I think that's helpful in the discussion of whether traditions are, are a hindrance or not. Now, another principle that I think is really important, and I don't mean to contradict anyone who could be listening or who's spoken already, uh, but another thing that my formation has taught me is that uh, traditions in a sense, we can talk about them changing. Yes, we can, because we see things change. We do things one way, and then we call something else a tradition. But another way of looking at it is that traditions deepen in time. Now, that does mean that the way in which they're manifested is different. But there's a big difference between change and deepening. And I want to highlight that, because really, from my perspective, a tradition is a physical manifestation of a truth or a fundamental human experience that we have had that we want to bring out and be a part of, of our regular life experience. Now, from this, <clears throat> I think uh, in light of the challenges that we're facing today and uh, amidst COVID-19 and just the challenges of economy that we have for an artist or for an institution, um, but also as personal as persons, I think uh, what we're always called to do as administrators, as professionals, and as persons is to continuously look and take the time to look, as Joel pointed out, and um, yeah, as Joel pointed out quite well, to stop and take the time to look, not to navel gaze, but to look within oneself and to reach in to remind oneself or to rediscover or to discover for the first time core experiences, core feelings, core identity marks that we come to understand as shaping who we are. And to me, this is very important because inst an institution has to do that. Uh, a person has to do that. Uh, an artist, uh, a professional, a craftsperson has to do that. Continuously look within themselves to reach into the authentic reality of who we are because the traditions are simply a manifestation of that. Uh, that have become customized or regularized in our life. But their cores remain the same as they may develop over time. That time to look within oneself or for an institution to examine oneself is key. And I think that the COVID uh, situation right now in the world, uh, here at Martyr Shrine, for example, I made the decision that the shrine would be closed for this year uh, to protect pilgrims uh, from gathering in large groups. Um, Every institution is facing a time of stop. Oh my goodness, things are different. Uh, our regular way of proceeding, our traditions, our values seem to be challenged to a certain extent. And in doing so, it creates an opportunity for us to take the time to actually go back to the core 
of who we are to the core of the institution and look at those core values, those core meanings that our traditions represent. And in doing so, for example, here at the Shrine, we realized that the, um, the personal encounter um, with the God that the people believe in who come here, the uh, physical connection to uh, the relics in prayer, the sacred space for prayer and offerings to be made for the many things that people bring here. You know, over the years since I've been here, almost half a million people have been to the shrine. And each of them are coming with unique desires, hopes, fears, concerns. Uh, some are seeking a uh, new life and want to have children. Some are wondering about marriage. Some are worried about their jobs. Some are having financial problems, whatever that may be. But the desire to come to a space where they can have offer a prayer. Now, for us, that meant uh, saying, well, prayer, unity in relationship with God, the sense of healing, the sense of sacred space were very important core things that are traditions that are here that could not be presented in the same way. And so we move those four elements as best as we could to an online experience with online masses, online prayer opportunities, moments where people could connect with a priest online, reflective pieces that bring out some of those themes that people could watch while online, etc. If we didn't touch into those core things, those core elements of how we were expressing tradition here, uh, we wouldn't have had the freedom, I don't think, uh, to find new means to bring them to life for people, to create a personal space for them in a very uh, large web world uh, that we have today. Uh, to close, I would, uh, I would say there's a fascinating book uh, that was written several years ago, uh, bringing some of these ideas um, around tradition and creativity to uh, the business, the so-called business world, or, or the world of, um, of institutions, written by Chris Lowney called Heroic Leadership. And I've actually recommended it, I think, in the past to you, Fred. Uh, and in this book, he, he highlights four key areas to the success of, uh, of any institution. One of those is a sense of self-awareness for a person working in an environment or for the institution itself. Another is love and the disposition of love. Another is heroism. And the final one, ingenuity. And I think that uh, if we can have the time within a tradition uh, to be, to grow in a sense of self-awareness, to go to the core of who we are and the things that we love and hold true, to be of some universal value or good that we want to share through our art or through our institution, then we'll find the heroism we need to be ingenious and to find new and creative ways to live out those core values within a tradition as those traditions deepen amidst adversity and changing times in our, in our art field or in our institution, in, in any aspect of our uh, labor and life. Thank you, Father Michael. Well, I would say to the audience that you've heard three diverse approaches to the subject of traditions, and we're going to undoubtedly hear more from you. Um, what we'll do for the next few moments, I believe, is discuss among the panelists uh, this topic. I do want to remind you, though, uh, uh, our audience members, that we'll conclude this discussion at 8 o'clock, and then you'll have a chance to comment or to ask questions. So we invite you to make your notes, uh, have your questions and comments ready. Uh, we'll prepare a speaker's list from the uh, Q&A box, which I think you're accustomed to from previous programs. We ask you not to use that Q&A box for the, for the wider audience for any other purpose. And so let's get started with our chat for, with, the, with the panelists. And I'm going to ask you, panelists, whether there's anything that any of the other panelists said that you'd like to comment on or expand upon. Joel? Uh, yes, I would like to ask uh, Father Michael, you, you mentioned about having to use, of course, the internet because you can't gather a crowd uh, for safety reason. Uh, how is that working? Uh, because I'm thinking some of the sacraments need uh, proximity. Um, 
um, d does that work online? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And one of the key things that that is important here in, in this work uh, is a very uh, personal connection, a sense of a personal connection, uh, whether it be for a person between the person and the God they believe in, uh, in, in Christ, or whether it be between the, the priest and the uh, pilgrim who comes uh, for spiritual conversation. Uh, and so one of the challenges of an online uh, experience is that for a lot of people that doesn't um, bring about a sense of the personal. Uh, and even, uh, even now, I know that the dynamic would be very different if I was sitting next to Wanda, if I was sitting next to you and we had that very human, our souls were touching as it were um, in, in the conversation and you too, Fred, uh, to, to have that there. Um, so it's a challenge. However, I must say that uh, many people are responding to that. And I'm very grateful uh, for the medium of television, for example, because, of course, uh, televised mass occurs across the country every day. And so there's a whole collection of people, particularly vulnerable people, who, who their only connection to the sacrament is, is through that medium. And we entered into that by offering our own. And so there is a a grace value there's a a tangible value to that experience but it's it's obviously not the same right but if we didn't have a sense of of what people uh nour find nourishing and valuable then we wouldn't have been, been able to even go that far and try and re-identify and try and re-establish by different means and so the creative process like that is never perfect at first it well nothing is really perfect anyway only very few things uh, so you work with what you have and you're attentive to the respondent and, and try and adapt accordingly to their needs. Thank you. Wanda, I have a question for you, Joelle, and um, just thinking about um, generations, you know, how many generations um, are coming to the festival, making art, showing their art, and are there any like shifts over the generations that you've seen? Um, in terms of what people are doing, wanting, talking about? Um, and do, are there any challenges to, to pleasing different generations in uh, one festival? Yes, we're, we're, um, we're very blessed to have three generations that come to the festival. So we have the children, the parents, and the grandparents a lot of time. Uh, so for instance, our performances at night are as early at 7 or 7.30, which is very early. But we can't have them later because at 10.30, you know, half of the crowd leaves either to go to bed or take their pills, you know. <laughs> so we do have the three generation. It's... it's um, and so we, we have them celebrating together. We have them eating together, dancing together. Uh, and it's, um, I would say that it's an important part of the festival. We now have a generation of parents. The festival started in 2002, I believe. So we now have parents that when, they're, uh, when they were kids, we now have children. They want their children to live that celebration and to have fun in French and, you know, for it to be, uh, to associate the culture with fun and celebration uh, and, and the sense of community. So um, I would say it's, it's more of, a, it's, it's more nourishing then it's a challenge. Mm. Um, it remains a challenge in the sense, and and uh, in the sense that, um, and I, I think I did mention that in in my early notes. Um, how will we keep the young generation interested in ten years? Will they still relate to the so-called traditions? If, as you have very well say, if our tra traditions are a, a live matter and they progress and they evolve, uh, it won't be a problem. 
And that, that, that's a way to measure if you are adapting as the culture evolves. But I would say that the three generations is, um, is a blessing. Yeah, I love it. And that's, uh, I love the festival format for, for keeping traditions going. I think it is one of, the, one of the ways in which family and multiple generations and all that can be involved in multiple ways. Yeah, it's great. We have an audience that's listening that is made up of visual artists, performing artists, poets, authors, people who run museums, people who run uh, artistic venues. And so I'm wondering if we can sort of hone in a little bit on those people. What I'm, I'm wondering what you would see to be the traditions of the visual arts or the performing arts? Wanda, maybe I'll begin with you because you're a visual artist. <laughs> um, I think it's a hard question because I think it crosses like different cultural backgrounds as well. Um, and it depends on what art we're talking about. But um, I'll speak just generally in the museum context because it's a Western um, uh, history. And I think like a lot of artists, you know, they train in school or they're self-taught and maybe museums become a place to one, hold their work for future generations, but also to have an engagement with an audience, you know, to be able to allow their work to communicate with um, people who come. So it, it can turn work, you know, it can make work into an education, it can make work into a beautiful experience that maybe you don't understand. It can be all kinds of um, beautiful things. Um, I think tradi the tradition of that in itself is not wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like holding work for future generations and, you know, creating an environment where people feel um, open and safe to come and explore unknown things, which I think is what you're doing in a way with, with um, visual arts. I think the other thing I love about the visual arts, um, and I work in all the arts, but is this kind of moment of communication with the unknown. So if you, it can create, um, especially with contemporary, because a lot of people will say, I don't understand what that means, or this makes no sense to me. You know, why is there this red blob sitting in the middle of the room? Like, what is this supposed to do for me? <laughs> and I, 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 um, I feel a sympathy with that because I think when I was growing up, um, visual arts was, you know, the work of Arthur Schilling Norvell more so it was like paintings and drawings and beautiful colors and it took me a long time to sort of walk into the world of visual arts that was more experimental and strange and and um full of things I didn't understand um but one of the things I liked about it is that it creates this openness inside of you for confronting something different from you without making you say oh I must understand that or I reject it if I don't understand it because I think that's not a great place to be. So I think those kinds of traditions in museums are pretty kind of where they're founded. The other part of museum tradition, I think, is that it was meant to teach us how to be national, like Canadians, or how to be good upper-class citizens, or how to be good Brits, you know what I mean? And so that's the part of museums I kind of rally against, because I think we need to be whoever it is we need to be, and it may not be that. There was a comment made uh, about um, literary traditions and, our, and uh, artistic traditions by one of you. And I, I'm wondering if you can clarify for me, are the, are the structures of artistic pursuits traditions, is that concept sort of interchangeable? And let, let, me, let me be specific, is the fact that music is composed as a symphony or a concerto with certain certain borders and guidelines. And I think you talked about boundaries, uh, Father Michael. Uh, a novel has a certain structure, typically a certain length and a certain way of, of, of being presented. Um, 
are, are those structural things to be considered by people in those pursuits to be traditions? Or is there a difference between a tradition and a structure? Yeah, that, well, Joelle, did you want to say something? I mean, I'll, no, I just ahead. say just say one thing there. Well, a few things. Um, I think I think in in the context of this conversation now, of course, I'm not a professional artist by any means in any stretch of the imagination. I think, but um, I think it's important as an historian looking at this to make a distinction, perhaps, between tradition and convention. Uh, because there are many traditions that are part of an art discipline, and then there are several conventions. So when we're, and, and some things are called traditions, and, and that term is used. Uh, so getting back to what Wanda said so uh, beautifully there just a second ago, I mean, in terms of visual arts, for example, if I were to talk about traditions, I think there are there are core traditions that influence all art across cultures. Uh, so to move away from the colonial Western dynamic or Eastern or think, I think there are things that transcend that are very important. And of course, many people talk about art as a transcending experience uh, and art is used often to articulate unity amidst diversity in many ways. We can be used lots of other ways too, though, to not do that. Uh, but for example, when I look at art and uh, visual arts and tradition, I would say uh, three core traditions would be, uh, number one, the idea that uh, the artist is interacting with something outside of themselves. Uh, the artist is uh, attempting to express that in a form and that form is meant to interact with other people, not always, but much of the time, uh, to, to inspire, to share the artist's own experience and so on. To me, those would be traditions. Mm -hmm. A convention would be to use a certain kind of brush, mm -hmm. a certain kind of stroke, uh, a certain kind of, of, of approach. And I think in art today, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the best things that's happening is... Um, presenting things that move outside of convention. So almost, it's almost like many artists have to, uh, or not have to, but feel moved to understand the conventions and the traditions behind them, and then find their own niche within that, which, which causes an evolution. That's a more modern phenomenon, whereas in the 16th or 17th century, how good of an artist you are is how well you follow the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, rooted in a tradition. So I don't know if that helps, but this distinction of tradition and convention uh, might be something for people to think about who are watching. Shuel, do you have, you were going to make a comment? Uh, yes. Um, about your, your question about, is it a structure or a tradition? Um, I'll, I'm speaking, um, concerning uh, music, because it's uh, an important component in our festival. Um, I would say that it's a traditional structure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That covers all the bases. Uh, uh, do I get away with it? Um, <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the groups, the, uh, the, the artists that perform uh, at the festival. And to be honest, when I started 10 years ago, I thought, you know, this, uh, this jig a jig, is it going to last forever? Are we going to get sick of it, of, of the two-step? And what's happening is that the artists coming to perform are of such a level that this French Canadian music is now uh, they've they, they've been res respectful respectful yes of the structure of the traditional structure so they have the 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 essence of it but it's now um, it's now to a level a level of being considered world music and they play around the globe. So they did respect the, the, the structure, the, the, the essence of the tradition, but it's, it's out there. And no, we're not going to get sick of the two-step because they are doing wonders with it. And it's, it's of such a level that it interests people 
around the globe. It's not, it's, they've blown it out of the, of the French Canadian uh, population. It's, it's out there. So it is a structure, but it's, if the artist is uh, of, uh, is, is of great capacity, it, it shouldn't be a limit. You've just sparked something for me in terms of thinking about, um, just because you, you made me think about doing um, square dancing and the two-step up in uh, Cree territory in Hudson Bay region. They just love it so much. <laughs> um, but just thinking about um, that these kinds of, yeah, those sort of traditional structures, how they can move and morph into other cultural spaces. And so it, it will still be related, you know what I mean? And it'll still have that core, but it may have a new context or a new sound or something added to it that's a bit different or maybe a new way it's used, but it still has that lineage in it, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting about art. Art can travel anywhere, right? It can go, and art generally is, is um, already traveled. You know what I mean? Like even in Anishinaabe culture, I mean, we we borrowed and shared and traded and did all kinds of things with other cultures, you know what I mean? So where the boundaries are, I think are not so strict. Um, and that's kind of an exciting thing about arts and culture. Mm -hmm. I've heard each of you say in your own context that, uh, that the traditions really aren't restrictive. They often uh, facilitate uh, transition. Is, is, am I right about that? Depends. I always say that there, when traditions are under threat from the outside, they can become quite restrictive or there could be a situation. So like we talk a lot in our community about, you know, certain like elders that are like so rule bound and will, you know, kind of get mad at you if you do something like a little off of, you know, the way the custom has been practiced or whatever, how they think of it. And most, most of us say it's just because either they've gone to residential school or they've been, you know, afraid of losing something or mm -hmm. it's, it's um, the way they've interpreted the, the, the tradition. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's a lot of discussion about what is it that we do keep? What is it that we can let go of? These are really difficult conversations for a community to have, right? And for an individual or a family to have, but they are decisions that you can make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I agree 100%. And also, I think it might be helpful to, I mean, just to realize, uh, like in history, um, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, late 18th, early 19th century, there was a, a propaganda or a vision put forward in Western society, um, if we want to call it that, that there was this huge break and all of a sudden we were enlightened, right? And there was the dark, medieval, horrible, spooky time. And now there's this wonderful, enlightened, Christian, economic, social and political reality that we're going to go with. And there was a break. But actually, when you study history, that's not true at all. And you realize that uh, Darwin was a very religious man, and his father uh, was in the ministry. Mm -hmm. You realize that Galileo's work that was put forward was largely based on Ptolemy, Ptolemy who was a totally recognized and accepted a natural philosopher by the church and state. Um, you begin to realize that uh, you know apples falling from trees around gravity uh, were based on inspiration uh, that come from a poetic and faith-filled person, not a cold scientist, you know? <laughs> so you begin to understand that um, nothing that is uh, came from nothing, uh, even creation, if you want to say that, because uh, it came from a creator. Uh, so that's important. Uh, to say there's a break isn't helpful when an institution or a person is reflecting on the traditions that they hold and wondering, you know, is it horrible to change it? Or we got to get rid of this, either, either side of the spectrum, because that's not going to happen. Uh, the human experience is one that, like I said, there is no break. 
there's a deepening. And, and I think that's an important concept to, to hold when reflecting on, on these things, at least for me. So I, well, I just want to remind you that I talked about the way in which another society can break your traditions if they want to <laughs> or try to. They can try to. Yeah. Yes, but they're going to shift and change, not deepen in that situation, right? Because of trauma and, you know, like suppression and oppression and things like this. So I do think that in, I've seen it in other societies where they make decisions to stop doing certain traditions because it is that kind of oppressive thing on another person or culture or being or way of being. I think these are situations where we might want to break and not deepen. Maybe we're deepening a different tradition to do better as human beings. <laughs> I, I would say it all depends if you look at traditions as a sacred cow or as a template with the, the, the basic elements that you are going to transform from generation to generation or if it's something, and, and that will, that is, um, that's an opposition that we have to, um, that we have to deal with constantly. Mm. Indeed. Fred, I was just curious about, um, are we going to dis uh, community discussion at some point? At eight o'clock, yeah. This is what he was asking in the question Q and A thing. So I just said yes, please ask your question because yeah. he didn't know. <laughs> the, uh, the producer told them that we 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 will be welcoming your questions in about two minutes. So uh, anyone want to add anything to what we've said so far before we move to uh, to our audience members for their input? Well, I'm I'm just hoping that within the questions we'll be discussing the language which is so very basic uh, when it comes to French Canadian culture. Mm -hmm. the, the language is just so much part of it. Mm -hmm. I think for us as well, like everything's being discussed in English. So the concepts in Anishinaabe would be completely different for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> So hint, hint, out there. The Jesuits still think in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> it depends where you are in the world. Right. Depends where you are in the world. Mais on peut parler français aussi, si tu veux. No problem. Because <laughs> it does change, right? With language. Absolutely. Yeah, because it's a question of meaning behind a term, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's power and meaning behind every word in a language. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Mm -hmm idiom and and one of the things i find when i travel is that is that what's funny in one culture isn't funny in another culture it's very difficult to communicate humor uh interculturally and maybe somebody will make a comment on that well i think it is time i'm funny in every culture you are you are there you go <laughs> just kidding <laughs> well i think it's time then that we uh that we move to uh uh uh, the next level of our conversation, I'd like, first of all, though, to just acknowledge the sponsors for this evening's session are Bales Dishon Wealth Management and the Huronia Players Community Theatre. So we're very grateful to, to them. We also want to express our gratitude to the Simcoe County Tourism Group. Uh, they are sponsoring the conference and to Rogers TV for their technical support. 